Good evening, friends. Good evening. I want to welcome each of you that are here to our Foundations of Faith program. I want to welcome those who are watching on television or online. Did you enjoy the music with Kelly and John? Isn't that a blessing? So thankful you've come out. I said the weather's starting to turn a little cold and wet, and I appreciate your faithfulness. And um, I hope you're praying as we do this series because I was telling someone today, we can decide to have a, um, a revival program, but we can't make a revival happen. We can just do it and then pray and do everything humanly we can do through prayer and the proclamation of the word to create an environment where the spirit may choose to move. And uh, I think we're getting to that point in history where we really need a revival. I believe that God wants to have another reformation among his people. Not only, only within our church, but within Christianity at large. And a reformation means a returning to the faith that was once delivered to the saints. You know, I like to always begin with an amazing fact. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Limba tribe in Zimbabwe, South Africa. There's a group of between 50 and 80,000 people there that claim ancestry with the Hebrews. And there's a lot of things that would lend you to believe that. They um, still practice animal sacrifice. Um, they wear yarmulkes. They don't eat pork. They circumcise the male children. They use the Jewish star on their graves. And they still keep the seventh day Sabbath, which they've been doing as far back as they can remember. Uh, BBC was very intrigued by this and they working with another group did a number of DNA tests back in 2000 on the Zimba tribe and they were astonished to find out that indeed they did have Hebrew DNA. And not just were they related to the Semitic DNA, they were particularly aligned with a group within the tribe of Levi that were called the Kohen tribe. And the word Kohen in Hebrew, it's the priestly tribe. And as near as they can figure, that sometime during the time after the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem, that uh, when Jeremiah and some of the remnant fled into Egypt, God had foretold they'd be persecuted in Egypt, and another group went south, picking up African wives along the way and made their way 2,800 miles all the way down to Zimbabwe. And they have done their best over the centuries to retain that faith and they worship a monotheistic God. You know, throughout the Reformation, there have been groups that have stood up for particular truths that seem to have been lost by God's people. And one of those truths that I'm very passionate about, we're going to talk about today, is the truth regarding the Bible Sabbath. Now the reason that I feel very confident talking to you about that is because it's one of the Ten Commandments. So you need to take that up with the Lord. Furthermore, it is the only one of the Ten Commandments that begins with the word remember. Why do you think God would start out one commandment with the word remember? Because he understood that there would be a possibility they would forget. And so our message tonight is dealing with the day of restoration. It is a day of rest and it's a day of restoring that has been neglected by much of the Christian church. Well, I've got a lot of fun things I'm going to be sharing with you and a, a lot of scripture. So if you like to take notes, you might want to get your pen out because uh, I'm going to be moving through them pretty quickly. First question, from where do we get a seven day week? You know, all around the world, everybody observes a seven day week. Now, that's really an unusual question because we understand why all the civilizations in the world have a year with approximately 360 to 365 days, even the ancient civilizations, because that's how long it takes the earth to go around the sun. There's something in astronomy that gives you that calendar. We understand why all the ancient civilizations had a month with approximately 27 to 30 days because that's the lunar cycle. That's where we get the word month from the moon. And, um, but where in the sun, moon, or stars, you know, of course you get a 24 hour day because that's how long it takes the earth to rotate one time on its axis, right? 
But where in the sun, moon, and stars do you get a seven-day week? Where can the world trace a seven-day week? The only place you can trace it to is Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it he had uh, rested from all of his work which God had created and made. You know, it's very interesting right there. It says, way back in the beginning, God established this weekly cycle. I remember I worked for about a year and a half with the Native Americans in New Mexico. And I talked with some of my Navajo, the Hopi, Sioux friends. And they said, oh, we had a seven-day week before the Belaganas showed up. That's the Navajo for white man. And I thought that was fascinating because the only place that can be traced to is the Word of God. Now, it's interesting, in the very first book of the Bible, in the very first chapter, second chapter of the Bible, it says, the seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. I don't know if you counted it, three times. Then you get to the last book of the Bible, there's another significant number mentioned three times. What is it? 666. Seven is the number for God and per perfect completion. Six is the number for man. Man was made on the sixth day of the week. You remember in Revelation it tells us that um, the beast power says everybody's supposed to bow and worship. And if you go to Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar makes an image, 60 cubits by 6 cubits. And I heard one professor say it was probably 6 by 6 by 60, which means it's like 666. And everybody's got to worship. The final battle is going to be regarding who you worship. One group will have the seal of God and worship God. The other group will have the mark of the beast and worship the beast. Am I right? The battle in the very beginning between two brothers, they both brought their sacrifices to God. They both claimed to worship the same God. One did it God's way. One did it his own way. And the one who did it the wrong way, he invented his own worship, persecuted and ultimately killed the one who did it God's way. That's going to happen again at the end of time. History will repeat itself. Jesus said, those who kill you will think that they're serving God. And so we're heading in that direction. So we need to understand these themes and God's commandments regarding worship. Right there in the beginning, God made everything in how many days? He made it all in six days. But how many days in a week? Because he made another day for what? Rest and worship. Because we're resting in him. Did God make the Sabbath rest just for the Israelites? Have you heard that before? This is one of the areas where my dear friends and some other churches uh, are making an assumption that is inaccurate. Listen to what it says. Mark chapter 2 verse 27. Jesus speaking. He said, the Sabbath was made for Jews. Is that what it says? M-A-N. It's just another spelling for Jew. You spin it around upside down. You can make that M look like a W, right? <laughs> what does he say? Sabbath is made for man, and that word there means mankind. What else did God make for man in the beginning? God said it's not good that man should be alone, so he made woman. Do we need the things that God made for man in the beginning? Not only did he make the Sabbath, he made woman. Do we still need women? Hopefully everybody is together on that one, right? <laughs> so these things that God made were not for Jews. They were just only Jews need a day of worship and rest? Or is that something everybody needs? Some more verses. Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7. Also the sons of the stranger, meaning non-Jews, that join themselves to the Lord to serve Him, to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them miserable in my house of prayer. Is that what it says? Make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house shall be called the house of prayer for all nations. Who quotes that? My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus, when he drove the money changers out of the temple, he obviously still believed that verse. And so he said, even the sons of the stranger, it's for everybody. Now, look at what's going on in our culture today and the stress. 
it is phenomenal. You know, uh, I think the five leading causes of death in North America, I'll see if I can remember them. You got heart disease, and you got diabetes, and you got stroke, and you got cancer, and um, well, one of them's accident, accidental death. They're all connected with stress. And stress is exacerbated when we don't rest. And there's never been a society that has worked as long and hard as we do now because for one thing we've got artificial light for the last 150 years, 24 hours a day. The other thing now is you can't leave your work at work. You bring your work in your cell phone with you and you're constantly getting emails and messages and texts and all kinds of things and it's like people are not resting. There is a chronic problems in first world countries that people are having with their health because they don't rest. You know, I remember reading that when um, Neil Armstrong and his partner went to uh, the moon and they were actually walking on the surface of the moon, Houston kept giving them commands and orders for every step they took. Now don't forget, get this sample and then go over here, make sure and check that, take a picture of this. And, and finally they stopped, they said, is everything okay? And they said, uh, yeah, we're fine. We just realized we're on the moon and we just want to stop for a moment and take it in. I mean, wouldn't you want to just stop and kind of look around and say, wow, I'm on the moon and I'm watching the earth rise. They said, well, we're probably not going to get to do this very often. We've got to just like stop and take it in. And so they finally agreed at the control center, all right, enjoy it, but don't wait too long. <laughs> we get so busy with life and the worries of life that we don't ever take it in. We don't rest. We don't worship. And the devil has us working so hard that we're destroying ourselves. Now how has God honored this day of restoration that we read about? Well you can read, we already read Genesis chapter 2, now go to Exodus in the Ten Commandments and that's Exodus 20, you can read verses 8 through 11. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy I want to pause right there. Why does he say keep it holy? Do you keep something that you don't already have? If I ask you to keep something for me and I walk away, you're going to say, well, Doug, what exactly do you want me to keep? You've got to give it to me first before I can keep it. So whenever God asks you to keep something, it's assumed you already have it. If you come to my house and it's winter and I've got a fire going and I say, can you keep the fire going? Uh, you'd assume the fire's already going, right? But if I said to you, can you keep the fire going? You said, no problem. And after I leave, you go check the fire and it's cold ashes. You'd say, why did he say keep the fire going if there's no fire? So in the commandment, when he says keep the Sabbath holy, it's pretty well understood that it already was and I'm asking you to keep it that way. And he goes on and says, and he blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God sanctified it. He blessed it. He commanded us to remember it. Remember, they're not the ten suggestions. They're not the ten recommendations. These are commandments from God. And I have people say, well, you know, I would, but it's, yeah, it's inconvenient, or I had something else I needed to do. I've never heard that excuse used when one spouse talks to another and says, you know, I didn't really plan on committing adultery, but, you know, something came up. And I, you know... I, no, you say, no, you keep it. It's a commandment. It's a commandment if we love God. God rested that day. He blessed that day. And he sanctified the Sabbath. He did something to that day that he didn't do to any other day. And Jesus goes on. And he says in Matthew 5, 19, Whosoever therefore shall break even one of the least of these commandments and teach men so, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus is not saying they'll be in the kingdom. He's saying if somebody is teaching others to break even the least of the commandments and, and uh, by example and by their word, they're not going to be in the kingdom. The people in the kingdom will call them the least. That's what he's saying. They will be called the least among those who are in heaven. They're not going to make it to heaven. You see the difference? Some people think, well, they're just going to be on a lower scale in heaven. He wants us to do it and he wants us to teach it. Isn't that what we just read? Whoever will do and teach them. So you might be thinking, oh, Pastor Doug, you're teaching the commandments. That's a little legalistic. 
The devil has intimidated a whole generation of Christians with being labeled as pharisaical or legalistic if we talk about the law of God. But I've got news for you. God talks about his law. Jesus talks about the law. Not that we're saved by the law, we're saved by grace. Amen? Amen. But if you love him, then you're not going to be afraid to find out what best pleases him. So in what two ways is the Sabbath a sign? It says, I'll give them my Sabbaths as a sign. Well, there's a couple things you can read about. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. It says, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord that does sanctify them. Now, he didn't just give the Sabbath to the Israelites. He certainly did remind them of it. But he gave it to man right back in the beginning. Remember, we learned God sanctified the day. Does God have the power to make something holy? Does God have the power to make you holy? See, it's a sign of that. Every Sabbath day, we're reminding ourselves that He can sanctify us. Another example you'll find, you can read in uh, Exodus 31, 17, And it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made. So He takes us back again to creation. How many people were in the world at creation? Two, right? What were their names? How many here are related to them? It's a trick question. You're also all related to Noah too, did you know that? And uh, that means we're brothers and sisters, right? And did he make the Sabbath for man? He wanted Israel to remind the nations of what they forgot. It reminds them that in the beginning when he created the heavens and the earth, he made one more day. So every Sabbath we remember that he can sanctify us and he can recreate us. He can create within us a new heart. Isn't that what David prayed? The Sabbath reminds us he's the creator. I don't think you'd have problems with the evolutionary teachings within Christianity today if people would have remembered the Sabbath day the way they were supposed to. Ultimately, a Christian is what? follower of Christ. Are we right? We together? What was the example of Jesus? Which day did he keep holy? Look in Luke 4 verse 16 and we read there, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, now what's a custom? Something you do once? Or is a custom a way of life and a practice? And when you say someone does something customarily, that means it's their ongoing practice. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue. The word synagogue means the church, the gathering. And he stood up to read he, scriptures. Jesus went to church and read the Bible every Sabbath. And you can look at the apostles. What was their example? What did Paul do? What was his custom regarding the Sabbath day? This one is in Acts 17 verse 2. And Paul as his custom was, he went in unto them three Sabbath days and he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. In fact, um, it says you read in Acts 18.4, some people say, well, he just reasoned with them out of the scriptures because he was trying to reach the Jews. But you read here, it says he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded Jews and Greeks. Indeed, when Paul wanted to arrest Christians when he first went out, he went into the synagogues looking for the Christians. Why would he look for them there? Because they kept the same day as the Jews. Now, I've got to pause here and issue just a little oasis in my rant. I remember when I first learned these things, it troubled me because I first accepted Jesus. I read the Bible. I went to church on Sunday. Most of the churches I went to, they'd meet Sunday, they'd meet other days, but they never really kept a day like the Sabbath. Uh, let's face it, most Christian churches, even within the Protestant church, even within the Catholic church, they might go to mass, they might go to church. I've preached in many different denominations. And I remember preaching in a Baptist church, and before I even got started, I met a deacon at the door, and he said, you better be done by noon, there's a football game. <laughs> and so, you know, and they go home, then they mow the lawn. Right? So most of them go shopping. If they don't keep it like a holy day, and I know there are some in our church that know the Sabbath truth and they're not keeping it like a holy day either. Beginning to compromise with the culture around us. But I remember when I first learned these things, it kind of troubled me. And uh, I was upset. 
But you know, I, I finally realized, look, I just want to know what does the Bible really say? Because I want to be a Bible Christian. What did Jesus really teach? What did the apostles teach? Now that's our next question. Did the apostles also meet with the Gentiles on the Sabbath day? Read in Acts 13 verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And then it says, on the next Sabbath day, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Again, you can read in Acts chapter 16, it says, And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city by a river where prayer was customarily made. All through the book of Acts and the Gospels, with everything that is said about the Sabbath day, they were not teaching that it was to be done away with. It was all understood. It's one of the commandments. And yet, it's rarely spoken of among Christians, and our whole society suffers because it's being neglected. People's health is suffering. Love relationships suffer. Families suffer from stress. And if they keep the Sabbath, and they'd have that quality time with God and with each other. And see, that's what it boils down to, friends. Right now, assuming you're alive and breathing, your heart is beating, you are experiencing life. Enjoy it. Look around. You're alive. At least for the moment. Right? You experience life in a dimension called time. If you don't have time, you don't have life. God tells us that love is demonstrated in time. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I bet there's more than one husband here who has had the wife say, we don't spend time together anymore. I've had Karen say that to me. We were just not spending time. I said, I was here all week. She said, but you were in your office. She said, it's different than like quality time. Now, do you all know what I'm talking about? Really communicating. Love is experienced in time. And God wants to have a love relationship with us. You can't be happy without loving God. You can't get to heaven without loving God. You can't obey Him if you don't love God. You can't love someone without time. It's in the context of time you get to know them. You get to express your love. Isn't that right? So after God made everything good, good, very good and beautiful in six days, He says, I'm making one more day so we can experience it together. You ever seen something wonderful and wish you had someone to show? But no one will ever believe this. What a beautiful view, whatever it was. God made us social creatures. And we spend time together. He wants to spend time with us. The Bible says He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. Jesus said to the disciples, can you come pray with me? And they went to sleep. Number eight. Did Jesus intend for His people to keep the Sabbath after He died for their sins? Now I already showed you Jesus kept it. Paul kept it. The apostles kept it. What about the church in the future? Jesus talking about the signs of his return and the end of the world. He says in Matthew 24 verse 20, Pray that your flight be not in the winter. He's not talking about a flight on American Airlines. He's talking about fleeing for your life. Pray that your flight is not in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Everything Christ said was in the context of assuming his people understood this was a commandment to remember. Does the Bible teach that God's people in the end time will need to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy? Now, most people up till now, they said, yeah, Sabbath sounds good, but I just mentioned seventh day. Because what day did God say He blessed? The seventh day. Does it matter? Did God say keep a Sabbath day holy? Or did He say keep the seventh day holy? Do you pick the day you're going to bless, or do we pick the day He blessed? And I remember struggling with this when I first learned these things. Let's read on here and I'll say more about it. Does the Bible teach that God's end time people... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, and here's the answer. The dragon was wroth with the woman. Who's the dragon? Satan or the devil, right? Who's the woman in this Revelation 12? God's church. You just know if the dragon's mad at her, it's the good church, right? And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The dragon is going to make war with those that keep the commandments. Think about this. Daniel chapter 3. Those who 
do not worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar will be killed. They've got to make a decision. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know the story? Will we obey the commandments of God or the commandments of the government? Daniel chapter 6. There it's the first commandment. Thou shalt not have other gods. King Darius makes a law that you're only to pray to him for 30 days. Uh, Daniel has to make a decision. Am I going to obey the law of the government or the law of God? In the end of time, it's also going to be a question of which God you serve or whose commandments you obey. If we don't understand that these things do make a difference, then we're just going to end up being a lot of milk toast Christians that say, Lord, Lord, and Jesus says, I don't know you. If you want to be a real Christian, if you want to have a revival, then start being one who says, Lord, speak, your servant listens. I'm going to do what I know you want me to do. The Sabbath is part of that. It's in the Bible. Revelation chapter 14. Just before Jesus comes, it says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, a message, going to the world. Jesus said, go into all nations. Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. This is just prior to the end. Talk about a judgment, right? And notice what it says, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of the fountains of water. Do you know that is an exact quote from the Sabbath commandment? It's calling people back to the worship of the creator, and that's what was, the Sabbath was all about. There's a message that goes to the world before Jesus returns. And later in this same passage, it says, I looked and behold on a white cloud, one coming like the Son of Man. Jesus comes. We have a message that's to go to the world, calling people back to not only be hearers, but doers of the word. Amen? Amen. You can read there, it also says in Revelation 14, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And the end of the book, Blessed are those who do his commandments that they might have a right to the tree of life and to enter in through the gates of the city. Blessed. He wants you to have that blessing. God did not bless the day so you could feel like it's a curse. But you know, one of the hardest things to give is time. My father had a lot of money. He's a millionaire. And uh, I'd want to spend time with him. And sometimes he was so busy, he said, oh, well, here's five dollars, go to the movie. And I was always thankful for the five dollars, but in my heart I'm thinking, I was hoping we'd do something together. Because sometimes it's easier to give a donation than give yourself. When you give your time, you give yourself. I tried to teach my kids, when you have an appointment, don't be late. Because if someone's waiting on you, you are stealing their time and you're stealing a piece of their life. It's rude. Amen? And so... Giving time is a precious thing. And so if you say, Lord, I love you, I love you, but I haven't got any time right now. Well, do we really love him? It's the supreme proof that you love God when you give him your time. When he makes an appointment, not you make your own. And he's made an appointment with us. Amen? He said, I bless the day. Put aside all the cares of life. Now someone's going to say, Pastor Doug, well, you worship God one day a week. I worship God seven days a week. Now, that's nonsense. First of all, I worship God seven days a week too. We're talking about keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath says, thou shalt not do any labor. And if a person says they're worshiping God by not working seven days a week, they're not holy, they're lazy. So we're not talking about that. God has specified a specific day. Matter of fact, he says six days thou shalt work. That's part of the command, right? One day you don't do any work so that we can have this quality time. And yes, it does say that coming together to worship God is part of the Sabbath. You read in Leviticus 23, the Sabbath is called a holy convocation. That means as far as possible, I know some people are, they're infirmed or they're shut in or they're isolated. But if you can, we come together to worship God. It's something you do corporately. Dwight Moody speak. oh yeah, and then that, I've read that. Dwight Moody said in his book, Wade and Wanting, I honestly believe that this commandment is just as binding today as ever it was. I've talked with men who say it was abrogated. He's talking about the Sabbath commandment. But they've never been able to point to any place in the Bible where God repealed it. When Christ was on earth, he did nothing to set it aside. You know, in fact, looking at my clock here, from talking about the Reformation, 
You know, a lot of the early reformers knew the Sabbath truth and kept it. Some of the early Waldenses and the Hussites and, and the reformers, they were burnt to death because they kept the old Sabbath, historians say. They kept the, the historic Sabbath of the Jews. Well, I don't know where God commands us to keep the Sabbath of the Gentiles. Can you show me a command? I'll pause here, our studio, I see a camera here. You might flip that around, not that I'm the director, sorry. Sometimes I'm a little of a control freak, but I don't mean to take your job. If you could turn a camera and get an audience shot. Show me one verse in the Bible that commands us to keep the first day holy. I only do that. I don't want to be arrogant. I do it because I know it's not there. But what day does most of the Christian world keep? First day. And there's not a single scripture that tells us to do it. Now listen to what the honest theologians from all these different denominations say. I'm just going to go through a few. There's scores of these I could read, but I'll run out of time. Baptist Church. This is written by Dr. Edward T. Hiscox, author of the Baptist Manual. There was and is a commandment to keep holy the Sabbath day, but that Sabbath day was not Sunday. It'll be said, however, and with some show of triumph, that the Sabbath was transferred from the seventh to the first day of the week. Where can the record of such a transaction be found? Not in the New Testament, absolutely not. There is no scriptural evidence for the change of the Sabbath institution from the seventh to the first day of the week. He says more. Congregational Church. Uh, Dr. R. W. Dale. Uh, this is his book, The Ten Commandments. It's quite clear, however rigidly or devotedly we may spend Sunday, we are not keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath was founded on a specific divine command. We can plead no such command for the observance of Sunday. There is not a single line in the New Testament to suggest that we incur any penalty by violating Sunday. The Lutheran Church, and this is in the Osberg Confession, which a lot of Protestants were involved in. The observance of the Lord's Day Sunday is not founded on any command of God, but on the authority of the church. Episcopal Church. The Bible commandment says, On the seventh day thou may rest. That is Saturday. Nowhere in the Bible is it laid down that worship should be done on Sunday. That's Philip Carrington. Presbyterian Church. This is Eaton, uh, Canon Eaton in his book on the Ten Commandments, there is no word, no hint in the New Testament about abstaining from work on Sunday. The observance of Ash Wednesday or Lent stands exactly on the same footing as the observance of Sunday into which um, uh, no Sunday divine law enters. He said it's just a tradition. Anglican Church. And where are we told in the scriptures that we should keep the first day at all? We're commanded to keep the seventh. We're not commanded to keep the first. That's Isaac Williams. Methodist Church, Amos Briney, his theological compendium. It is true that there is no positive command for infant baptism, nor is there any for keeping holy the first day of the week. Many believe that Christ changed the Sabbath, but from his own words, we see that he came for no such purpose. Those who believe that Jesus changed the Sabbath base it on only a supposition. And I've got pages of quotes like this. Honest theologians know that if you're going to go by the Bible, all we can do is look around and say, well, this is what everybody's doing, so we're going to do what everyone's doing. A reformation means you break out of that mold and say, we're not going to follow traditions of men. We're going to follow the Word of God. And when we decide to follow the Word of God, you're going to see something remarkable happen. Not only will God bless, the devil's going to get very upset. Amen. Maybe that's what we need. Persecution often refines. Will all of the saved be keeping the Sabbath in heaven? So we've already shown the apostles and Jesus. What about in the future? You can read Isaiah 66, verse 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it will come to pass that from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come and worship before me, says the Lord. All flesh. So you look here in the Bible, we see, we know Adam kept it in the Garden of Eden. We know the children of Israel kept it. We're going to say more about that. We know the apostles kept it. We know we'll keep it in heaven. And who do you think the preacher is going to be there? Jesus. Nobody will sleep during the sermon when he preaches. <laughs> At what time of day? Let's get a little more specific. Does the Sabbath actually begin? Some people think, well, it starts at midnight or something. No. You know, we set our clocks back this uh, week. Some of you came an hour early. 
Um, they do that too in the morning. That's not when the Sabbath starts. You read in the Bible, it says from even unto even. Leviticus chapter 23, 32. You'll celebrate your Sabbath at sundown. And again, Mark 1, 32. And at even when the sun did set. Now someone's going to send in a question and say, well, how did he keep the Sabbath in the International Space Station? Send that in. We'll do it for Facebook after the program. You want to know the answer, don't you? <laughs> question 12. Now this is where people say, well, you're right. We're supposed to worship God every seventh day. But since we, you know, the calendar has been changed, we don't know what day the seventh day is. Have you heard that? Can we be certain that the present seventh day of the week, Saturday, is the same Sabbath day that Jesus kept holy? Absolutely. Luke 23, 54, you read in your Bible. And we know that when Christ was crucified, it says that day was the preparation. That's what you call Friday, the day you prepare for the Sabbath. And the Sabbath drew on. So it's the day before the Sabbath. And then it says they returned and prepared. It was so thoroughly ingrained in their minds how Jesus felt about the Sabbath, they would not even finish embalming his body. Most of us would say, well, that's, you know, the ox is in the ditch. You got to do it, right? They would not do it. Matter of fact, you know, Jesus spent seven hours on the cross. Do the math. Crucified at 9 a.m., died at 3, took an hour to get his body off the cross, six hours alive, one hour resting on the cross. Jesus died before the Sabbath. He rested from his work of redeeming man through the Sabbath. He rose Sunday morning. He did not rise to establish a new Sabbath. He rose to continue his work as our high priest in heaven. And so he even kept the Sabbath in his death. So I want to go on here. So we know Good Friday. They went home, kept it. And by the way, who wrote the Gospel of Luke? <laughs> Dumb question, right? <laughs> what I meant was, he was a Gentile, right? So this would have been a great place for him to say, and they went and kept the Jewish Sabbath. Luke doesn't call it that. He says, the commandment, right? And then Sunday morning, the women come to the tomb. They see it's empty. Mary comes first. He appears first to Mary Magdalene. And when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Week. If that does not convince you, in over 105 languages of the world, the word for the seventh day of the week, what we call Saturday, is Sabbath. Now, it's not so in English. We get it from the Greek God, but you speak Spanish, it's Sabado. It's Dobre Subota, Sabbath in Russian, right? And uh, if you're in Micronesia, it's Pong Shabbat. And uh, 105 languages, isn't that interesting? They all have the same word. It was the Sabbath rest, even in the places where the religion was not Christian. The name they had for the seventh day of the work was the Sabbath. Because it goes all the way back. And you say, well, Pastor Doug, the calendar was changed. You're right, the calendar was changed. Let's look at the change. The most prominent change in the last 2,000 years was when we went from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. In the Julian calendar, they needed to adjust for the seasons. It was nothing, no conspiracy here. So they took October 4, Thursday. They added 10 days, and it went from the 4th to the 15th. There's a picture you can see to kind of relate to. You notice it went from Thursday to Friday. So did they change the calendar? Yes. Does a change in the calendar ever affect the weekly cycle? No. It makes no difference. So whenever, say, because people see the week on the calendar and they see the month on the calendar, they think they're interwoven. They're not. They're two completely separate cycles of time. That's why your birthday is on a different day of the week every year. Someone wrote a letter to the U.S. Naval Observatory. James Robertson answered, there has been no change in our calendar in past centuries that has affected in any way the continuity of the cycle of the week. And so none of it ever affects the week. And if that doesn't convince you, because some people are skeptical, it doesn't matter how much evidence you give them. You might convince me that there was a Jewish family that got washed up on a deserted island and as devoted as they were about Sabbath keeping, they lost track of time. Or they were in a dungeon, or it was cloudy so long they couldn't tell what the days were. But you're not going to convince me 16 million Jews around the world 
have forgotten their holy day. Am I right? They're still keeping the same day. And you might be wondering, well, what happened? We'll try and get to that tonight a little bit. Have the Ten Commandments been changed? No. The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not my covenant. I will not alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Every word of God is pure, and you shall not add unto his words, lest he reprove you and you be found a liar. Let us hear the command. Change God's law or just attempt? And yeah, God foretold this would happen. Does breaking just one of God's commandments matter? It does. You read in James chapter 2 verse 10, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he's guilty of all. I mean, if you go to the judge and say, look, your honor, uh, I realize I killed that person, but it's only one person. I am a good citizen other than that. And I'm faithful to my wife and I pay my taxes. You can say, I'm sorry, you're guilty. So does one commandment matter to God? I believe it does. So what happened? Where does Sunday come from? Doesn't come from the Bible. Here's Encyclopedia Britannica. I'm trying to just have time for some of the most convincing evidence. The earliest recognition of the observance of Sunday is a constitution of Constantine in 321 AD. That's be like 300 years after Christ. They thought, well, you know, we'll reach a lot more of the Romans. They kind of worship on the first day of the week. We don't want to be like the Jews because they had become very unpopular and so they began to distance themselves from the Jews and they started to keep the commandments of men to be more popular. And that's what it says in Matthew 15, 9. Jesus said, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now I've got to pause here and just make this clear. Pastor Doug, are you saying that people who have been going to church on Sunday are all lost? No. God winks at our ignorance. Acts chapter 17 verse 30. He's a merciful God. There's, gonna, there's a lot of beautiful, spirit-filled people that don't know this truth. Will there be people in heaven that had too many wives? I'm talking about all at one time. Will David be in heaven? Jacob? Even Solomon? Will I be in heaven if I take extra wives? No, he's not going to wink at my ignorance because I know better. And so sin is knowing to do good and not doing it. If we continue to sin willfully after we receive a knowledge of the truth, Hebrews chapter 10, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. And so God is calling us back to his word to bless us, not to be a burden. Amen? Some say, well, God just created the Sabbath for the Jews at Mount Sinai. It's not correct. Did the Sabbath exist before Mount Sinai? It says, Moses and Aaron, after God called Moses at the burning bush, he met his brother, they went to the elders of Israel, and they gathered together the elders, and they told them, God is going to do something wonderful for you. You need to consecrate yourselves to him. You need to remember to keep the Sabbath day. How do you know that, Pastor Doug? Look at what happens when Moses goes to the Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I don't want to let them go. He goes on to say, Behold, the people of the land are many, and you make them, what? Rest. You know what that word is in Hebrew? Shabbat. You're making them keep the Sabbath. Because Moses said, you guys need to turn back to God. This is before they even got out of Egypt. They knew what the Sabbath was. You're making them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh said, I'm going to teach you a lesson. I'm not going to let you rest. I'm going to have you making bricks with no straw. I'm going to increase the quota. Now, if Moses represents Jesus and he says rest, who would the Pharaoh represent? The devil. He wants to increase our burdens so that we are restless. Now, Jesus said, come to me. I want to give you rest. And the Lord is trying to call us back to the blessings that we're missing. He says, go and tell them they're going to have to make bricks without straw. Notice what happens next. We're just tracing this history here. After Moses then leads them out of the land of Egypt, they cross the Red Sea. Before they get to Mount Sinai, they get hungry. God says, I'll give you bread from heaven. This is in Exodus 16. He said, I'm going to give you bread six days a week. There'll be no manna from heaven on the seventh day. 
Some of the people didn't trust God and they went looking for manna on the seventh day. And God said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? The Sabbath was a commandment and they have not even gotten to Mount Sinai yet. Isn't that right? Exodus 16 is the manna story. Exodus 20 is the Ten Commandments. It goes all the way back to Genesis 2. And so please don't fall for that popular argument. Well, that was just for the Jews. I mean, who believes that only Jews are supposed to rest? Only Jews are supposed to worship. And why wouldn't God, what was wrong with the seventh day? Why would he change it? Did he make the seventh day before or after sin? Before. It was perfect. God's law doesn't need changing. We need changing. Amen? What blessings is God promising to those that are contained in the Sabbath commandment, that those who remember it. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And what does the Lord want to give us? I'll give you rest. He wants us to have peace. He doesn't want us to live in fear. He doesn't want us to have stressful lives. He goes on and says in Exodus 33, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Now someone's going to say, Pastor Doug, we're not supposed to keep that commandment because we only keep the commandments that are repeated in the New Testament. I was doing a seminar like this and a lot of people were coming from this community. A pastor came who disagreed with me and right during the talk he said, Brother Doug, you're putting these people under a burden of works. And it kind of stopped everything so I had to address it. I said, why do you say that? He says, you're talking about keeping the Sabbath. You're putting them under a burden of works. I said, no brother, I respectfully disagree. I'm telling them to rest. You're telling them not to rest. You're putting them under works. <laughs> and I said, do you believe God wants us to keep the Ten Commandments? He said, no. And then people in his congregation were actually in the audience. They went, oh. And he said, well, yes. And then he knew that would include all ten. He said, nine of them. And I said, so you're telling me the only one we're supposed to forget is the only one that begins with the word remember. <laughs> and I said, well, it, it doesn't appear in the New Testament. That is a myth. You know, you repeat something, people think it's true. There is a commandment that does not reappear in the New Testament. It's the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Where is that in the New Testament? closest you get is the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be thy name, right? But do we find the Sabbath commandment in the New Testament? Many, many times. And you can read in Hebrews, he says, they will enter into my rest. He spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. There's a number of scriptures and Jesus never said that it was done away with. And here's just a few of those. You read there in, it says, they'll enter my rest. He says, there remains a rest for the people of God. And that word rest there means a keeping of the Sabbath. Sabbatismos. You know, we're looking at the last days right now. Two groups will worship. One will have the seal of God, and one will have the mark of the beast. And it really boils down to who you obey. I want you to notice something about those who worship the beast in his image. It says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest. Who has no rest? those who worship the beast they have no rest who worship the beast and his image who does have rest those who come to Jesus and Jesus said if you love me keep my commandments he goes on and says if you know these things John 13 verse 17 if you know these things blessed are you happy are you if you do them so we've been talking about a very clear Bible principle, a teaching. It may not be popular in the Christian world. Well, I've heard pastors say, Pastor Doug, I know this is in the Bible, but what will happen to my congregation? I'll lose my job if I take a stand for this. Friends, what profit is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? We need to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. Jesus wants us to come to Him and experience that rest. That's the great invitation. Come unto me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, I know some of you are hearing new things. And I'd like to recommend, there's a lot more I have to say. There's a website you can go to. 
And it's simply sabbathtruth.com. I think they're going to pop that up on the screen there for you. Wonderful website. A lot of